And did you want to uh, introduce Kurti or? Oh, Alex, go ahead. Okay, I will. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Imaging One World. So, um, I think um, today we're uh, very lucky to have Christian Wilms talking. Um, so, Christian's the R and D. Um, um, I'm going to say direct manager. I was going to say director, but manager at uh, Scientific, <laughs> and he's going to talk about the. Um, um, advantages of three photon imaging, which I think, uh, so this will be a very much a technology talk, so um, where we can learn what three photon imaging is good for. So over to Christian. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Um, you see, is this sharing properly now? Yep, yep perfect. perfect. Right, thanks Thanks for the chance, uh, for the invitation, the opportunity to, to, to do this. Um, I was good. Going, going to talk a bit about well, ultimately things that we've we've learned both myself and then we as Scientifica over the last couple of few years doing doing three photon imaging and I want to talk a bit about the general challenge about why you <clears throat> want to do three photon and why not spend a bit of time on the instrumentation um, probably mostly focusing on the laser sources because that tends to be um, the place where we see the most in uncertainty and, and questions come up and then finish off if there's time with a bit of, well, simple eye candy, um, showing a few examples. Now, starting with the, with the talk proper, um, I was told years ago that you should always start a, a, a presentation with a statement that everybody in the room, even if it's virtual, can agree with. And I think um, that a good one to start with that here is, is fluorescence is beautiful and it's very useful. And I'm not gonna tell anyone here something new when I say that it can be used to study a lot of processes um, of life in life. Um, a lot of biology can be lovely or easily studied with microscopy. Now, the problem there is of course that biology doesn't happen at the surface. Um, and this is true for, for, for animals as well as for plants. Um, if I look at this uh, rather well-known mammal, um, a lot of what we want to see in terms of organs or so is going to be inside. And there are workarounds to that. I can, I can use optical windows. I can introduce just windows into, into the abdominal cavity or into the, the brain. Um, I can use organ explants, but even then we only get so far um, and, and we still need to be able to penetrate below the surface because for example, if we're interested in the colon here, looking studying colon cancer and, and, and metastasis, um, the issue is that once we get down to the colon, we still have to look into the, the, colon, the bowel lining and to, to get into the, the crypts and, and the villi where the processes actually happen that make that, that cause cancer. And this isn't just true for, for animal um, tissue, this is true for plants as well. When looking at an Arabidopsis root here, um, we can see a lot on the surface, but what we're really interested in is, is what's happening inside this root system, right? The, the elongation zone, the meristeme, this is where all the hormonal signaling happens. That's what we want to see. And being able to get that access is, is really what I'm going to be talking about. First approaches were simple mechanical workarounds. Um, and this is an approach, this is a lovely example of that is, is using micro prisms, inserting these micro prisms here, roughly the size of Abe Lincoln's nose on a US penny. Um, you can insert them into the mouse brain, that's where it's commonly used. You can see this working really well to study plant vasculature and the like. And the, the refractive surface in the prism basically acts almost like a periscope and lets you sidestep, go deep, and then look at um, your structures further down. Um, so this can be taken to the extreme by going to micro endoscopes where you can insert um, small grin lenses deep again here into brain, mount one of these head mounted microscopes on top, um, and then use the wide field one photon imaging of structures that are several millimeters deep in the brain. But there's a downside to this, and that is that while you can see that far down, you're also causing substantial damage. And the neuroscientists here will please forgive me if I say that the brain is actually fairly permissive to this. You're, you're causing damage, but the brain function still works and the animals will survive. If you were to do this in the, the gut and the bowel, as I was showing previously, you're setting yourself up for, or your animal up for, for system epsisemia. If you want to try this to, to image deeper into the liver or the lung, you can see that sepsisemia isn't your worry, it's just 
basically instant cause of death. And this is really where two photon microscopy came into its own, comes into its own, and has been used heavily over the last two and a half, three decades now. And just taking a step back, looking at fluorescence in general um, as an introduction to, to photon, we have here this very schematic uh, beta barrel of GFP. There's a fluorescent photon, it excites um, the GFP and the GFP emits a photon. Looking at the electronic level, this is the epitome of a quantum process. Um, there's a lower state, energy state, um, the S0 state, there's the excited state, the S1 state. We need to bridge this energy gap and you need to, the molecule needs to absorb a photon, a quantum of that energy and quanta with the wrong amount of energy that don't bridge this gap just won't do the trick with a small caveat. And this is something that was initially hypothesized by Albert Einstein right in the, in the first, his first papers on the quantum nature of, of fluorescence and energy transfer, and then fully worked out in a lot of beautiful detail by Maria Gerhard Meyer. Um, and that's the idea that if two photons of half that energy, so twice the wavelength, interact with this molecule at exactly the same time, and we are talking about the speed of light, particles traveling at the speed of light, crossing a small structure on the angstrom level um, and interacting with their electronic system at the same state of time. So this is tens of attoseconds to hundreds of attoseconds we're looking at. But if you get that interaction, um, you are able to bridge that energy gap and you're back in the excited state and then the process flows exactly as it did with one photon. But now you've done that by using two photons and that has two specific advantages. The first is that you're using um, longer wavelength light which can penetrate the tissue deeper. And I'll sh show you examples of that in a second. Um, and the other is that you need this really high photon density. And this high photon density is only achieved even if you're using pulsed lasers to, to kind of compress your, your laser light in time into short 100 femtosecond pulses to get that pulse energy and then the peak power to really have enough light there to excite your sample to get this, this simultaneous interaction. Even then at biological power levels, this only happens at the focus. And looking at what this means in practice, this is um, an objective dipped into a beaker with fluorescein solution. Um, I'm shining a 488 nanometer light through there. You can see you get this beautiful little double cone of light, which is nice. But if you're interested in what's happening at the focus here, that out of focus fluorescence is going to blur what you see. Now, as you all know, this is where confocal microscopy comes in. You place a pinhole that's confocal to this in the detection path. You block all of the light that's not arising from the focus and you've got a nice crisp image. Now, if you start doing this in scattering tissue, the issue is that as the lights, the photons from the focus get scattered, they're generally still heading in the right direction, but they're not ballistic anymore. They're not coming straight from the focus and they will be rejected at the, at, at the pinhole. So you lose light very quickly. And this is where the strength of two photon comes in because you only get that excitation in the spot. Now this is two minutes later, all I've done uh, besides slightly moving the camera apparently is um, switch to a titanium sapphire laser and you see the same fluorescein solution and you get this excitation spot right here in the center. No, almost no, no detectable out of focus fluorescence. And this means you can dispose of the pinhole. So, and then just acquire all the fluorescence light um, that, that the objective is able to get. And the assumption is because you're only exciting at the focus, any light, no matter how scattered it is, as long as it's detected, it's coming from that focus and then gets assigned to the relevant pixel or voxel in your intensity image. Um, and this, these two, so the first, this means you can go really deep, you can, no matter how deep you're exciting, you'll be able to collect some light and generate an image. And the fact that infrared or near infrared and far red light um, pass through tissue well, very well. And that's not just the case for, for mammalian tissue or a human tissue, it's the case for a lot of insects as well as the case for plants. The fact that you have got this transmissive window means you can also image deeper. So you can get your excitation deeper into the sample as well. So the beauty of two photon imaging is you're able to excite deeper and you're also able to get that specific fluorescence um, detected from, from, from deeper in. And this is why it's really been the workhorse imaging system um, solution, sorry, for, for imaging deep into tissue, both in plants, 
Um, here we've got again the Arabidopsis root. And if I had this as a Z stack, you could follow one of these little rootlets all the way to the tip, some and, and really see the structure as it evolved and merged into the main root. It's something you wouldn't be able to do with the with, with one photon method. And similarly, if I can get this to play, um, we have you can see. Sorry, just let me shut this off. You can see the um, in, in a zebrafish larvae, looking at the brain, we have a bunch of microglial cells labored. And again, you're able to image really nice, clear, deep, fairly deep into tissue. Now, if everything is so nice with two photon, why not get greedy? Why not say, well, if two, two photons are enough, why not, or, or good, why not go to, to three photon excitation? Have an even longer wavelength, less scattering, have an even stronger confinement to the focus because you now need three photons to interact with your sample. So you need to have even higher, dense, uh, even higher concentration of, of excitation for it. Um, photons to be able to efficiently do this. And in practice, that means you're looking at lasers that have even shorter pulses and even fewer pulses. So in two photon imaging, you're using something in the order of tens to, to, to about 100 megahertz repetition rate in, in three photon. You're looking at something more in the single um, digit megahertz range. Um, but but that is possible. Um, you, you can do this, and it is widely done. And the question then really is, given that that two photon works, why would you want to do three photon? What is it that, that really drives people to, to take that extra step up and, and introduce the additional complexity? And this is a nice example of, 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 of why. You have here um, a, a mouse brain, image taken from a mouse brain. Um, this is, I believe, motor cortex. We're about 750, 800 microns in. Um, these are not stained with GFP, but a genetically encoded calcium indicator, which is dimmer than GFP. And what you see is you see clearly can tell neurons here, but there's also quite a bit of haze and blur. And if you look at the functional imaging, you can still pick up individual neurons occasionally flashing. You can still see some, 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 some activity, but the contrast is really not great. And that's not because this is a horrifically bad experiment or so it's, it's a general known sorry a generally known principle um, if you look at work here from 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 Patrick Thier and uh, Thier and, and and Winfried Denk this is almost two decades ago now you can see that um, sorry give me this that that in, in in agarose gels with fluorescent beads as well as in in mouse brain where the the blood vessels are labeled with the fluorophore or in mouse brains expressing um a genetically encoded calcium indicator in in mouse brain in in, in the neurons in all cases you see that as you get deeper, the contrast gets worse. And the reason for that is that this background fluorescence gets much brighter. And this is kind of the dirty little secret of two photon imaging. We always say, oh, there's no out of focus fluorescence, but actually um, that's not entirely the case. And because as you're going deeper, you're losing excitation light due to scattering, aberrations, you're PSF degrades a bit. What people tend to do, and for because you need to be able to image that deep, is crank up the power. And as you're cranking up the power, you're starting to get more and more scattered and high highly concentrated scattered um, excitation light at the surface as well. And at some point, um, you have enough po laser power there to get two photon excitation, not tons of it, but quite a bit. And because we don't have a pinhole, all of that those photons will also happily be collected and detected, and then the their signal would be assigned to, to the voxels down below, which that were actually exciting. Um, and, and hence you get this washing out. And comparing, but comparing this a bit more quantitatively, um, this is work done by Kevin Takasaki and, and, and Jack Waters at the Allen Institute. They went ahead and they compared two photon and three photon, stepping into um, deep, oh, ever deeper into a mouse brain. This is again, a mouse brain expressing a genetic encoded calcium indicator. I believe this was GCAM6. And what you can tell is the two photon images start out really nice, good contrast. You start losing a bit of that detail in the background already at 300 by 400 microns. You start getting a bit of a blur by 500, you've got this haze and by 600, you, you're seeing something very similar to what I was showing you before. In contrast in three photon, you get this really nice high contrast and that just stays there because you have this additional confinement, because you now need the, that interaction of three photons, you've really narrowed the likelihood or reduced the likelihood of an out of focus fluorescence to almost nothing, even if you're in scattering tissue using fairly high laser powers. And so, so one reason you might want to use it is just to get clearer 
um, better contrast images in deep tissue. Another is to go where people haven't gone before with pure optical methods. So say again, looking at a mouse brain, looking at a coronal section there, you have the coronal section, you can see a few details and structures zooming in here um, with an image based on, on, on data, uh, on image from the Allen Brain Atlas. Um, you can see that you've got the mouse brain, um, you've got the neocortex, you've got the white matter outer capsule here, and then you've got the hippocampus. And I've overlaid here the, um, the, the proposed two photon sensible two photon imaging depth limit as, as, as shown from the data from the Allen that I showed you before, and the, what you can do with 3P. Now, if you're just really interested in getting the best possible contrast with 2P, you kind of hit a limit at four or 500, but you can obviously push that further. People have been doing two photon imaging all the way down to layer six on a fairly routine basis. You can balance factors and really tweak the experiment to work just nicely, but you can't really get below that without resorting to invasive means. Whereas with three photon, you can happily push through the scattering layer into the actual cell layers in, in, in the CA region of, um, of, of hippocampus. And this is what that looks like in, in data from Yusaku Hontani. Um, broken into three, three color channels. You can see that you get the blood vessels labeled with Texas red all the way through down to the bottom of the imaging depth of about 1.2 millimeters. You can see that you get quite a bit of cell bodies expressing uh, GCAM6 in, in, in layers four, five, and, and probably six of, um, of neocortex. But you also have some neurons down here in, in the CA1 region, I believe it is, of of hippocampus. And if you look at the third harmonics um, image, I'll say a few words about what that is specifically later. It highlights here the, the exactly this connective tissue. And the ability to see below that is really something that you only have with three photon imaging. So going where no one's gone before. And then the final one is being able to be less invasive. Looking now at fruit fly or drosophila, um, obviously insects have, have trachea. They have these air-filled pipes or tubes running through their body to get oxygen there. And that's, of course, highly scattering. So even with two photon imaging, if you want to look at the drosophila brain, and I believe this is through the cuticle to leave that intact so that you can actually do longer term imaging and come back to the same animal. Um, what they find is, is you can see down to about 40, 50, 60 microns, and then stuff gets really blurry due to scattering. And there's a way around that. Um, you can just go ahead and degas, uh, get all that air out of the trachea. That's great. You can see all the way through the brain. But you've now, of course, have the problem that um, it's a degas gas environment that is not a live animal, and you're definitely not doing function imaging. Step in three photon. Uh, with three photon excitation, you're also able to get all the way through pretty much the entire fruit fly brain through the cuticle and still see with cellular resolution. And, and acquire activity down there. So it can be less invasive and the same can be done um, with, with mouse, not obviously through the entire brain, but you can image through the skull there as well. So recapping um, what we have here, um, um, what we have here is, is um, reasons to choose 3P over 2P as well, one imaging in thick, tissue, being able to, to see deeper, even at modest depth, uh, better, better S and R and contrast, um, and just get better quality data. Um, it can be less invasive. You can image through the skull of a mouse or through the cuticle of a fly, as I just showed you. And as I showed you with hippocampus, it gets access to, it can provide access to novel specimens or regions. So why not just do 3P? all of every time and forget about two photon. Now I already mentioned the need for these low repetition rate lasers. So commonly you'll find people are using one megahertz lasers, uh, some go up to two, rarely up to four, um, to do most of their imaging, at least if you're working with commercial systems right now. And that means you have a microsecond between laser pulses. Now, if you imagine you're doing resonance scanning, 30 frames a second, um, nice functional imaging, you have a laser pulse every eight to 10 pixels, not good for image formation. So you really can't go very fast if you're doing three photon imaging. That's really one of the key bits. And the next is that, that for a given power, you can get quite deep. Yeah, hang on. Um, you can get quite deep, but you can use less of that power. And the reason here is the water absorption. So we've got the water absorption curve here in blue. And you can tell if you look at the typical two photon area where you've got GFP uh, or GCAM, and or where you have the red fluorescent proteins, M cherry and the like. So at about 900, 920 and in the range of about 1020 to 1100, um, 
we see that water absorption is fairly low. And in fact, people have found that you can image to with fairly high power levels. Um, I know that that people imaging very deep will routinely use something on the level of four or 500 milliwatts. Now that leads to an increase in temperature, but um, in the brain, so rule of thumb is approximately once you hit about 200 milliwatts in the mouse brain, you're looking at about a degree increase, um, but you don't really incur massive amounts of heat damage at that point. Very different in three photon imaging. Looking, this is work done in Chris Shue's lab, um, at Cornell University. And what they found is that around 120 to 150 milliwatts at 1300 nanometers, you've reached the point where you're starting to incur photo da uh, heat damage. Um, now this varies, this is specifically for the mouse brain, um, different tissues will have different heat dissipation, different specimens will be behave differently as well. Some will be more sensitive than mouse brain, others will be substantially less so. I've heard in non-human primates that people have been using on the level of 400 milliwatts in some cases even, um, though I've not seen that one. Um, but you can see there's, there's a limit and it gets even more pronounced when you get to this near infrared two window. So besides getting around this massive peak between 14 and 1500, um, now you're at a level where you can use about in the mouse brain 40 to 60 milliwatts of average power and then you're done. And all of this is really summarized very nicely in, in this graphic from a paper from, from Wang and Chu in, in Optica. This is highly recommended reading for anybody who wants to get a better feel for the in and out of, of three photon imaging. What they really do is they start from this point, right? The two big things that set 3P apart from 2P is the longer excitation wavelength and that higher order nonlinear um, excitation and pick those apart into ups and downs. And it's the fact that you're imaging slower, the fact that you can use less average power. So that that's interlinked because you can use less average power. You need to go for um, higher, for, for lower repetition rates to get your pulse energy. So there's, there's a lot of balancing to do here. And the upshot of this is that, that there isn't a final 3P is better than 2P or 2P is better than 3P as in many things with imaging. It's a matter of really matching what you're doing to what you're trying to achieve in your experiment. So now you've come to the point that you said 3P is what I wanna do. This is really what it's about. Um, how do you go about that? what you need to be able to do three photon imaging. And now I'm gonna spend, as I said, a bit of time going into a few of the, the aspects of in terms of instrumentation. The quick overview is you need a microscope that can deal with that kind of near infrared wavelength. You need table optics that are able to deal with that kind of wavelength. I'll say a lot, a bit more on the microscope in a minute. Um, you need, and this is really the biggest, um, the biggest item, you need a light source that's usable for three photon imaging, something that's tunable around 13 to 1700 nanometers. There's no real need to tune in, in between around 14, 15, just due to that water absorption. But if you get it, then it's there. Um, you want to be able to do this at biocompatible average powers, you're going to want high pulse energy or peak power, and then finally pulse management. So starting that list from the beginning, looking at microscopes, um, most multi-photon microscopes nowadays will happily do three photon imaging as well as two photon imaging. The things to look out for there is on the one hand that you have good transmission for the wavelengths you need. So you'll find that this shifts. Some companies will do microscopes that are really transmissive between 17, 700 and 1700. Others will have a cutoff around 900 going up to 17 or 1800. Um, but that, that's really the key that you get that light through, but it's not the only thing. You also need to be able to focus that light. I've indicated this here, and these are kind of uh, very schematic curves in both cases. <clears throat> I've indicated this here by showing the strail ratio over the wavelength. What it's really about is, is, being, is ensuring that you're able to focus those wavelengths as well. Being able to get light through is not the same thing as being able to focus that light. So you want to ensure that you're able to get diffraction Im imaging um, so having that strail ratio over about 0.8 um, between the wavelength range or at the wavelength range that you want to image. And that's not always a given. Some of the older two photon microscopes might actually not be able to, 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 to achieve that. So that's something you want to look for. And then the final thing on the microscopy side is that's often forgotten, not looked at in that much detail is the objectives. And I say it's not looked at that much detail because people will of course look at it. And what they'll often look at is, can I image at longer wavelengths? But there's a trade-off here that, that you need to consider, um, which is that extending the objective transmission to the longer wavelengths for excitation oftentimes means that you're losing 
excitation um, or efficient transmission in the visible, which is exactly where your fluorescence happens. So if you look at this, these the, the, between these two microscopes, you can see that here you've gotten, sorry, these two objectives, you have um, a transmission that goes up to well over 80%, bordering on 90% in the visible, um, but start losing intensity quite quickly in the excitation. Whereas here you're quite nice in the excitation for at least for, for GFPs, but you lose a lot of that fluorescent signal. And the message here is that um, excitation power is expensive. Uh, it's, it's laser power that you need to buy, but it's purchasable. Whereas fluorescence is ultimately purchased with, with photo damage. So there's a limit to that. Now that doesn't mean that looking at only the, the visibility, the, the transmission to visible is the way to go. It will be a balancing act. If you're in a sample that, that's very bright, um, you might be able to get away with a bit less transmission in that wavelength range. So again, this is something where you, you need to choose based on your experiment. Now we come to the laser source. This is this is really the biggest sticking point. This is where we have the most conversations with customers on a regular basis and the most uncertainties because it is ultimately currently the most expensive part on in a three photon system. This is a big investment. Now the problem is that 1300 nanometers and 1700 nanometers aren't really native laser wavelengths. There's no material that you can find that will just happily provide ultra fast pulses in those wavelengths. Instead, what you need to do is you need to take a readily available laser and wavelength shift that. And the currently most common way of doing that is to get a nice powerful pump laser in the micron range. So that means between 1,030 and about 1,064 nanometers. And that goes into an OPA. In the OPA, there is a second harmonic generation process. I'm only mentioning that because for the, for the more advanced, for the physicists here, the, um, the wavelengths otherwise seem to be a bit irritating. So you pump this, you get um, two wavelengths out, one of them is shorter than the pump wavelength. And again, the reason for that is that you have this wave frequency doubling. The other is longer than the pump wavelength. The signal wave beam, so-called signal beam, is the shorter one. And the idler is the one we're interested in. That's the longer one. This is where you get your wavelength at wavelength range of 30 to 1700. You can adjust one of these two, and the other one follows passively, just dictated by energy conservation. So that in the end, the sum of the frequencies is, is corresponds to what you'd expect from, from the pump. Now, looking a bit more at the parameters here, you're using a fairly long femto laser, so 200 to 300 femtoseconds pump uh, pulse duration. Um, you're using fairly low repetition rates, typically under 2 megahertz. Um, you're using fairly high average powers, typically still under 50, but definitely over 20 um, watts. And that results in generally fairly high um, peak energy, sorry, pulse energy levels of about 200 microjoules. Now, coming out of the idler, the beam is substantial, or out of the OPA, the idler beam has substantially shorter pulses. You're looking at 40 to 60 femtoseconds. And that's really what you want to achieve all the way through down to the sample. And we'll get to that when I talk about pulse management. The repetition rate feeds through, but then you see there is the reason, this is the reason why you're pumping with these high average powers is that it's ultimately OPAs are not that efficient. Um, the ones commonly used in three photon imaging have an efficiency in the range of about 5%, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less, but you're basically getting in the range of about two to somewhere between one and four watts out on average power. And generally that corresponds to in the ideal operating range of about up to four microjoules of power. Now, that means you've got a tunable light source that gets you to the wavelengths that you want. The problem is there can be a bit inflexible. Say you've set this up to image nice and deep, you have an OPA that's being pumped by um, a laser at pumping at one megahertz, you have your average power resulting from that, say you're pumping here with, with 20 watts. So you have a corresponding pulse energy of, oh wait, let me mess this up, 20 uh, microjoules and, um, and all is good. But now, and then your idler follows that, you get your about one watt average power, um, you get your, your about one microjoule, uh, sorry, yes. Um, 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 and pulse energy, um, but now you'd like to go faster. You'd like to do a bit faster imaging. You don't just want to, um, to image at the speed given. So you'd like to double that frequency, um, that repetition rate so that you can um, 
um, um, um, image faster. The assumption being here that if you have a pulse every microsecond, your pixel dwell time needs to be um, um, an integer multiple of one microsecond. So if you can double this, if you can go to two megahertz, you can get away with uh, it, multi integer multiples of, of 0.5 microseconds. So you can image faster. So you could imagine, well, I can just set this pump laser up to take that average power of 20 watts and spread it over two megahertz repetition rate instead of one. So now your pulse energy is, it would be 10, um, 10, 10, 10 microjoules. And that's, that's all valid. You can set your pump up to do that. And then you'd, you'd expect that to, to feed through on your excitation, but sadly in practice, that's not possible. And the reason for this is that the, the crystal the, the crystal driven process, the, the actual optical parametric um, generation in the OPA is highly nonlinear. You need to have a stable pulse energy going in there. You cannot change the pulse energy without first having, without having to realign and, and re or re optimize your OPA. And if you imagine getting an engineer from a company and every time that you want to change the repetition rate is, is not exactly cost or time efficient. Um, so what's the only solution? Well, the only solution, unfortunately, is to go ahead and say, instead of using a 20 watt pump laser, I'm going to use a 40 watt pump laser. And now I have twice the number of pulses at the same pulse energy and my pulse trade follows that. Now, again, a quick reminder, why would you want to change repetition rates? Very often what you'll do is you'll start, uh, you'll find that you're doing different types of imaging on a system. You'll be imaging in your cortex where you can get away with fairly high repetition rates, typically one to two megahertz is common. You have enough pulse energy, everything is good, done. Now you want to get through the scattering layer. You're gonna lose quite a bit of excitation light on that. So going through this, this white matter, what people commonly do is they change the repetition rate of the laser to somewhere between a quarter to half of a megahertz to be able to have a, a biocompatible average power. So still within those 100 to 150 milliwatts average power to have enough peak energy or peak power or pulse energy to be able to get efficient two photon, three photon excitation down here. And that's really the need to switch. So in practice, what that means is you start off with an either output that has an average power here, that light red line, pinkish line, and that's higher than your heat load limit um, for the given pulse energy. And then what you do, of course, is if you need that repetition rate, is you do exactly what you do in two photon imaging as well. You just attenuate that average, attenuate that average power. Now you're not using a pocket cell here because they're too dispersive. You're using a half wave plate with a polarizing beam splitter or in some form of liquid crystal device is what we tend to use um, for this. And vice versa now, or then other, alternatively, if what you're interested in is to keep those really high pulse energies to be able to go deeper, you just pulse pick and you just drop every second pulse going into the OPA. And then the OPA follows that and gives you those only every second pulse. Um, in both cases, what you've done is you've thrown away power. Um, so, and this is the bitter pill that, that, that currently based on the existing technologies needs to be swallowed is that you're buying more pump power than you actually need for super, if you want that flexibility. For superficial imaging, you're going to be dropping your average power and for, um, for going deeper, you're going to pulse pick and, and just drop every other pulse or three out of four pulses or the like. And yeah, that's just one thing to keep in mind. And this is really um, the reason that you find people using power ranges for pump lasers from 20 watts, in which case they're just set to doing one thing only, all the way up to 100 watts, which is, I think, something you see from coherent spectra quite a bit, um, with this idea in mind to be able to have that flexibility. Right. Um, I mentioned um, that you're using very short pulses. And because of that, um, dispersion becomes an issue. Now dispersion, specifically group delay and group velocity dispersion is something that then the resulting pulse broadening is something that people know from two photon imaging. But because you're using much shorter pulses, it's more pronounced, the effect is more pronounced in, in three photon. So as a brief recap, um, if you have a continuous wave laser, your laser is continuously emitting photons and you have the steady flow. Um, of photons. If you now go to a mode locked laser to do two or three photon imaging or mode locked laser or any other form of ultra fast pulse laser to do three or four photon, photon imaging, you're compressing those photons down into a very short amount of time, 100 femtoseconds. That's, that's a fairly, gives you a fairly good idea of where in space those photons are. Now Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that if we have a good idea of where a particle is, we probably have a fit, we need to have a fairly bad idea 
of the amount of energy it's going to make. So what that means is that while in the case of the continuous wave laser, you have a nice sharp, say 920 nanometer um, spectral line, when you start getting that mode locking and the laser starts pulsing, that broadens up and suddenly you have a central a Gaussian peak like peak centered on your core set wavelength line, but you have shorter and longer wavelength light there. So say 920 plus minus um, 20 nanometers, or if you're going to to um, to really short pulses at, th at 1300, that then is 1300 plus minus 50 nanoseconds. Um, and that's fine if um, you get this pulse zoomed in here and you have a blend of wavelength. That's great. That doesn't matter at all up to the point where we realize that the speed of light is a constant only in vacuum. Once you pass through matter, and that is glass in your objective and all of the microscope, um, the speed of light is actually wavelength dependent. And generally, in most in the most commonly used wavelength ranges, that means that the longer wavelength um, photons travel through that batter, that glass quicker than the shorter wavelengths. So what happens is you take this nice short pulse in the case of two photon, that's where this comes from, is 100 femtoseconds. In the case of three photon, you're looking at something like 40, 50 femtoseconds. And you start pulling it apart by, by pulling that, that, um, those, those frequencies apart, those different wavelengths apart. You're making that pulse broader and broader. It's a process known as chirping because um, in acoustics, if you have a, a pulse of sound that changes wavelength, you get this chirping sound. Um, and that's just a given when you're dealing with, uh, with ultra short pulses going through glass. What can you do about that? You need to compensate for it. And you best do that by a process called pre-chirping. You basically introduce an inverse of the trip that your microscope introduces an inverse of this delay by using commonly a prism compressor. I can say more on that if, 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 if people are interested, um, but it gets, there's no need to go to that level of detail. And all that that does is it slows down those longer wavelength, what longer, longer wavelengths and speeds up those faster wavelengths, uh, shorter wavelengths. So that as you pass through all of that glass in the microscope and the objective, the pulse gets successively shorter. And ideally, you come out with a pulse that's very close to what you started with. Very close to, um, because for different reasons, there are higher order dispersion effects as well. You can't really get perfect. And the more glass you have, the more dispersion you have, the more difficult it gets to get to that. So avoiding dispersion is better than compensating for it. One last note on dispersion. This is a graphic I've taken up with um, APE in Berlin kindly let me um, use here. If you look at the dispersion of, a, of typical microscopes over the relevant two fo three photon wavelength range, you can tell that there is quite a bit of different behavior. But most cases, what you have is you have a point where the microscope stops introducing positive dispersion and starts introducing negative dispersion. And that's just something to keep in mind. Commonly, that switch happens in the range of about 15 to 1600 nanometers because it means you can't use the same pre chirping approach for the shorter and the longer wavelengths. So at 1300, you need a prism pre chirper. At 1700, you need some other means of introducing a positive pre chirp on it. And this is really uh, mentioning all of this because it's really vital that when you set these systems up, you ensure that you have a pre chirping. Um, mechanism planned for that you have some form of pre-chirper there ideally something built with tunability and the different wavelengths in mind um, so finally putting all of this together this is from an installation that we had set up at the Champs de Maud um, in, in Lisbon for a summer course and um, we have here the pump laser uh, this is an amplitude Satsuma HP2 so a simple 20 watt pump laser we have here an AP an, an, an OPA um, this is an Avis from, from APE. Um, the same unit is available as a Mango um, from, from, from Amplitude. Um, the light from the OPA or the idler beam from the OPA goes into the compressor. As I described, right, this is a prism compressor with a bit of funkiness in the material to ensure that you can get short pulses even if you're using 1700 nanometers. The light from here then, I skipped over this so far, goes through a um, so-called autocorrelator. The only reason for that is that you want to be able to measure the pulse width. And this is a CARPA autocorrelator from APE. The reason we like using this one is, or it's generally used quite widely for this, is because it has a remote detector that lets you measure the pulse width under the objective, which is where you're really interested in the pulse width. And then finally, that light gets coupled into the microscope. Um, 
And with that, we've got the tour through the instrumentation done. I think I have a few minutes left. I want to just show a few excitation or application examples. One thing I want to say a few words more on in, that I mentioned early on was uh, third harmonic generation. Um, THG, it's ultimately, it is just a higher order scattering process. It's a three photon process in contrast, for example, to second harmonic generation, which is a two photon process. What that means is that in third harmonic generation, three photons of a given wavelength are scattered as a single photon of shorter wavelength. In second harmonic generation, it's two photons that are scattered like that um, to form one of half the wavelength. And that also means that Three THG behaves exactly like you'd expect from three photon in terms of confinement um, to the focal plane and THG tends to blur, SSG, sorry, tends to blur a bit as you get deeper, just like two photon fluorescence does. So it's a process that's the scattering happens pretty much anywhere in a medium, but it happens particularly at refractive index um, interfaces. And that means specifically if you're looking at brain at myelin where you have a lot of lipid, um, but also on blood vessels and the like. And it's really interesting and it's worth mentioning because this is label free. It's a process, it's a scattering process, it just happens. You just need to look and you just need the right filter set to look at this. And it's important because it gives information on structure. It tells you where you are if you're in the brain, which where where are you if you're in other structure tissue, where are you? It's it's a navigation aid. And it also is a nice, if you're working with genetically expressed indicators, one big question is, I'm not seeing anything. Is this because my label isn't expressing? Is this because the microscope isn't working? Is it because I'm just not in the area where the label should be expressed? And having that label free um, mark or, or a signal is really key and really helps. And some examples here, this is from Rathildrim's um, paper from 2019. You see here a bunch of neurons expressing, um, I believe it was GFP, it could have been GCAMP as well. And um, the blood vessels showing up as a really strong here magenta um, SA THG signal, and you see the white matter down here indicated. And then over here, an example from, from, from you, where you see um, the blood vessels again, and in this case, they're labeled with a fluorophore. You see um, a bunch of cells that are neurons in this case that are labeled with um, an injected um, dye, um, orgogreen bapta 1 AM. And you see the white matter, and again, indicating the, the border to the hippocampus. So this is, is lower neocortex, you're probably in layers five, six here. And again, you, you see this really nice fiber structure. Um, you can image through all of neocortex. This contrast isn't that great. This is from a transgenic animal expressing TD tomato in all inhibitory neurons in interneurons in cortex, which means at the very bottom here, where you see the last few cells, um, that's also the end of the structure. So this is about a millimeter deep. This was really taking it to the limit um, of, of where those cells were expressed. Um, you can do functional imaging. This is um, was acquired by, by Rob Lees and Adam Packer at Oxford. I'm looking about 850 microns deep in neurons in mouse somatosensory cortex, where um, you can see because of the speed, ah, sorry, this is, I was hoping to get those cells flashing. Um, hang on, let me switch this off. There we go. And you can see that you can do functional imaging here as well. Obviously, you're imaging a bit slower, and it is a, it is a dim, fairly dim signal, but this is functional imaging, as in generally uh, from confocal to two photon, the signal tends to get a bit dimmer from two photon to three photon, I guess, as well. So you balance everything in your favor. And you can so see this is this is nice, simple functional imaging. And on the same system um, from a recently published paper. Um, also acquired in that lab, um, some imaging into subventricular zone. We're imaging here. You can see this was before we introduced SA, the third harmonic generation um, filter set into the system. You can see that you have this negative staining of the cor likely corpus callosum. And then you can go underneath that and at, at 1.1 millimeters deep, you see these, these cell bodies showing up. And this is not with, with any additional um, adaptive optics or anything applied. This is really just a simple system set up um, in, a, in a biomedical uh, scientist's lab, um, no need for, for any optical engineers or physicists to be present to help tweak this. This is really showing that in many ways, three-photon imaging is a technology that's, that is ready for prime time. It's not 
on, it's not a purely developmental technology. It's not as easy to use as, and straightforward to use as, as confocal, but it is get very close to what you, you're, what people have gotten used to from two photon imaging at this point. And I'll end with what is one of my favorite samples. This is one of the very first ones we acquired. This was um, at the Crick Institute from a sample from, from Christine Rosalso's lab. This is a sternum explant from a mouse. Um, you'll see the, the connective tissue in the sternum as an SHG signal, and you'll see that blurring I meant before as well um, in red. And you have the nesting positive cells, which is basically the stem cells are labeled in green. And why I like this is the fact that you're going all the way into this, what is ultimately solid bone. This was one of the first things, we, uh, this, the first three photon imaging we ever did. This was a system that was heavily power limited. We were getting just 30 milliwatts out of the objective. And with those 30 milliwatts, we were still able to image 200 microns deep into, into solid bone. And as you can see here, the green, the red signal, the second harmonic signal shows this out of focus blur that you'd expect from a two photon process. But the, the green cells, while getting dim, still have clear contrast. So if we'd had more power available at that point, if I was to repeat this today, we probably would see substantially deeper and, and see really nice structures there. And with that, I'm, I'm pretty much done um, and open for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Oops. Thanks, Christian. Uh, excellent talk. So what we will do is uh, everyone, please post your question in the chat window. We actually have one already from Dan Gunton, but what we will do is uh, we will do the Mentimeter quiz. So it's uh, it will be done by Nick and me. So Nick has got COVID and his throat is down, but I guess he is not. So <laughs> he, he prepared the quiz and I'm doing on his behalf. So we'll have some uh, interesting synchronization things going. So Nick, that's the warm up, right? 3P, 2P. Uh, yeah, so everyone please uh, deep, deeper, deepest. So we have our first participant already. So yeah, usually wait for a few people um, to, to log in. And uh, so the, the quiz link is uh, below and we have very uh, interesting and uh, questions from Christian. So. People who listen to the talk might find the questions very interesting and you might make an error or two. So please do log in. What is DGU? Good. Okay. So about five people. So that gives you a 20% chance of winning today's quiz. If we have more people, the better it is. So we just wait for a couple of more seconds. So Christian, until then, uh, there are a couple of questions popping up. Yeah. Have a read, and this will give you more time to think over the questions. And we'll then, uh, Nick, shall we proceed? Like seven yeah. people, about a couple of minutes we already gave. So first question coming up, everyone. Yeah, is that, uh, does that show, right? Yeah, so about eight people now. So so they are you presenter, and ah. you are already on the leaderboard. I guess. Let's see if we get the question. You have to enter, Nick, for this. Yeah. Uh, Not the next. There we go. Yes. No, That's it. So, yeah, faster you answer, the better it is, uh, the more points you get. So, the main depth limitation for two photon imaging is signal loss due to scattering of fluorescence light, signal loss due to scattering of excitation light, contrast loss due to out of focus fluorescence. A tricky one, but uh, let's say easy one also. Okay, yeah. so it's a pretty split decision between seven people. So it seems, uh, uh, Pishan, you want to have a few comments? People can reflect on this. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really we we obviously there is a loss of, of fluorescence light as you go deeper there is a loss of of excitation light as you go deeper but the general the really the limiting factor that people have been stumbling on is that loss of contrast that I showed initially this is what Winfried Denk back then called back back twenty years ago called the fundamental depth limit into photon imaging that like once you lose the contrast there's really not much use of having efficient excitation of your the fluorophores in that area because you're just getting too much background. Some people would have piped the contrast lost as a signal loss due to. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, Agent X9, so that's interesting. So Agent X9 is uh, leading the leaderboard with 50 points. So next question, Nick, Nick thanks. Uh, so it's the okay, here we go. Up. As you can see, Nick's voice is super down. <laughs> Almost like a money heist, the professor using a work <laughs> modulator. Currently, the biggest advantage of two photon over three photon imaging is the achievable imaging depth, the achievable scanning speed, the achievable contrast. That's uh, also a very split decision. Actually, now in retrospect, like I think we should have waited longer. We have 11 participants in the quiz. So, Nick, uh, sorry, Christian, any expert comments? Yes, I mean, this was this was one of the ones I harped on about um, two yeah. photon. Um, you can obviously get deeper with three photon. You can get better contrast with three photon, but two photon is really, if you want to go fast, currently at least, that's the way to go. You need That's where you need two photon. Especially when some of the tissue sections are fairly large. I think Agent X9 is still leading, yeah. Ooh, head on head. Next question, Nick, please. So question three coming up. Which cannot be a three photon process? Third harmonic generation, fluorescence, second harmonic generation. I guess this is an easy one. Since you stressed it a few times during the talk. Oh, we still have one wrong answer. Yeah, I think that was one I harped on about quite a bit because uh, I realized that initially when I ran the talk that in in a practice run that I actually didn't mention it at all properly. Um, but yeah, second harmonic is, is ultimately, it's, it's the coupling of, or the interaction of two photons in that scattering process. So it's by definition a two photon process. It can never be three. almost cake and agent nine neck to neck 50 point difference so it's so dan was fastest in this round so dan uh, you can catch up quickly so fourth question coming up to work efficiently opas need Stable average input power, stable input pulse energy, stable output wavelength. Yeah. Any comments on the split? <laughs> It's yeah. I mean, I put this in because it's it's misty. It's it's um it's difficult, right? The the stable. Average power is actually not that important. It's it's the energy. Um, it's it's the pulse energy. So if I double my average power, but I also double the repetition rate, I still have um, the same pulse energy, and that works just fine. Whereas if I um, if I keep the average power the same but change my repetition rate, I'm changing the pulse energy. And either if I'm going down, take that pulse energy down, I'm losing brightness. I'm massively losing light or vice versa. If I go up, I'm probably risking damaging the white light crystal in the OPA, which is the most, the single most expensive component in there ultimately. So yes, it's, it's definitely the, the input pulse energy that needs to be stable. A lot of people don't look at um, this way. So yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's what I struggled with when I, right, I was always, I always thought of average power coming from 2P. That was all I needed to know. And suddenly confronted with this idea of looking at pulse energies and peak power um, changed the way I look at these things quite a bit. So Cake is leading the way now with, uh, comfortably with a few hundred points. So last question. And let's see, Dan, you are being fast, but I guess you answered or missed one of the questions. So it's between Cake and Dan. Third harmonic generation is a label-free intrinsic contrast. This can be right. The result of expression of genetically encoded markers may be a form of fluorescence from injected dyes. Why not? <laughs> so I guess anyone who has heard the talk, this should be a 9-0. Oh. We still have got one wrong answer. 
<laughs> so yeah, that was fairly obvious one. Yes, which, it was. You stressed a lot. <laughs> I, I needed a number five, <clears throat> and it was another one of these. It's, it's nice to just kind of reinforce that point. So all of the the the, the topics were basically points I thought would be worth reinforcing. Um, <clears throat> So it, 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 it's almost like a cycle or a, or a car race or a bike race. Dan just nicked past the last round and not by many points. So congratulations, Dan. And it seems you really listened to the talk and are expert in the field. What we will quickly remind is uh, uh, next week we have uh, Oded Rekvi. Uh, Rek, I don't know how to pronounce the name but pretty famous Twitter guy and also a famous professor, professor from Tel Aviv University. So please uh, uh, do come. He's always a great speaker. And uh, Dan, if you mail Georgina, uh, uh, we will uh, post you a folder scope. And Christian, now we will take questions. So what we do is we invite the people to ask the questions themselves, basically in the order they posted the question. So we have Dan. Oh, Dan, congratulations. I think you are the same guy, Dan Gunton. And then we have, after that, Lior, and then we have Fabian. So yeah, in that order, guys, if you can, uh, fell, off the, fell, off my, fell off my bike at the start line. Okay. So uh, Dan, if you start the, um, the asking your question on two photon, and then we take it in that order that I mentioned. Yeah. Hi, Christian. Uh, thanks for that. That was a really good talk. Um, yeah, so I was just sort of wondering, so with, uh, with two photon, you get certain fluorophores where they've got kind of like a high excitation peak and a lower excitation peak as well. So like um, quite often I do GFP and TD Tomato together exciting at 920. Um, so I'm just wondering, do you know if you get many, if you get the same sort of effects with those sort of dyes with three photon as well? Or do you know of many people who can sort of get red emitting fluorophores with like a 1300 nanometer excitation? <clears throat> Okay, so um, the, the first big caveat to mention there is that um, we haven't really, we don't really have tons of, of excitation spectra for three photon yet. Um, I think right now it's a bit over a dozen, um, which, and, and a lot of those are, um, <clears throat> are, are, well, hit and miss in the sense of they'll focus on, on small ranges, but not the wider range though. Um, <clears throat> and there no, there's no molecular brightness spectroscopy or, or three photon cross-section measurements that I'm aware of, at least as of yet. Um, having said, which makes it difficult to find, having said that, there was a recent paper by uh, Yusaku Hontani, where I showed the, the, those three um, different, that, that basically split of hippocampal imaging into blood vessels, neurons, and third, third harmonic. Um, in Chris Shu's lab, they did aim for exactly that. How many fluorophores can you hit with a single wavelength? And I think they easily did four. Um, there's other work from, from a group in Nijmegen, um, Peter Friedel's lab, um, that, that published multicolor imaging there as well. And again, with the aim of how much can I do with as little tuning as possible. Um, and TD Tomato is a very nice example. Um, the TD Tomato imaging I showed before was actually acquired at 1320, not at 1600 um, or 1700. So it has a very broad um, three photon excitation peak as well. So you are able to, um, you do have these serendipities where we're able to, to image multiple fluorophores at the same excitation wavelength, despite the fact that they have different emission. But just like going from one photon to two photon, uh, predicting the, the spectra isn't excitation spectra isn't that straightforward. The same is true for going to three photon. They tend to be a bit narrower than the two photon ones were, but obviously not as narrow as the, the three P ones, uh, the one P ones were. Um, does that give you all the background bits you need? I'm happy to send you the link to that paper, by the way, um, if you haven't don't have it on the screen yet. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I knew it was going to be heavy, heavily caveated, but uh, yeah, thank you. Cool. Yeah, so our next question is from Leo. Leo, uh, yeah, you're here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I saw a few walks where they used heavy water uh, in terms of the uh, uh, water absorption lines that you spoke about. But then again, if you uh, inject uh, heavy water, then they will over time be replaced by the atmospheric water vapor. And also it's toxic, so you cannot apply it directly on the sky as far as, as I understand, or I saw a work that has done exactly that. 
Can you comment on that uh, in both respects? It's 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 something I find intriguing. Not something I've ever done or done with any of the the collaborators I've worked with on this. Um, <clears throat> I believe the 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 most common approach I've seen was just using an open craniotomy and and applying a solution based on heavy water um, instead of a one based on regular water. That obviously solves the water vapor problem because you have a massive reservoir and it just diffuses down and you have that um, that isotope swip swapping. Um, in practicalities, I, I can't say it makes perfect sense. It obviously the data is there to show that it shifts that water absorption peak and that helps. Um, if it's something we're going to find seen wider spread use is, is difficult to say, right? In, in many ways, two fo three photon imaging is now fast forwarding through the development that that two photon imaging did in over the course of the 90s, because we know from two photon all the stuff that we should be looking at, and we're kind of squeezing that together. Um, I'm fully aware that two photon, three photon imaging goes back to 1996, but it's really only hit prime time about five, six years ago. Um, and, and I think we might find that things like heavy water or changes like that might end up being just um, cul-de-sacs, um, dead ends that that technically are promising, but they're just not usable for, for wider, um, more widely. I might be completely wrong. It might be that it's the one technology that really kicks this off. Um, it's... I, I recall heavy water and D-Storm also. Marcus Hauer published a paper, but uh, you get more photons, but nothing followed up. I think it's already like 12 years old paper. So yeah, yeah. interesting technical developments, but don't catch up somehow. Yeah, Fabian, uh, you are next. Yeah, hi, Chris, uh, Christian. So thank you so much for the talk. So I was wondering, um, Chris Drew has also been working on, on laser sources, which <clears throat> can be kind of bursted so that you only, let's say, if you're interested in, in somata, that you only direct laser pulses where actually somata is, where your scanners kind of have about this. So where do you see the commercial potential and the kind of roadmaps of the laser manufacturers you're in touch with? So you, you, might have, you might have picked up on my uh, always um, caveating my statements on imaging speed with uh, the term what's currently available, what's commercially available. I'm, I'm aware, of, um, I'm aware of, 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 very much aware of that laser. Um, it's, it's a very interesting approach. So the idea is, is ultimately average power doesn't necessarily need to be average just over a continuous pulse train, it can be averaged over bursts of those pulses as well. So you can get away with very high repetition rate pulses in a short sequence if you're using scanning microscopy, if you just have a low enough duty cycle. So if 5%, just elaborating on what, what Fabian was saying, if 5% of your total image is actually structure that you're interested in, if you only open or use apply laser in those 5%, you've, you've cut your average power by a factor of 20 right there without the need of, um, of, of using these low repetition rate lasers. So you can go very fast. And I believe he, he was imaging at, at, at 60 frames a second at some point, or his lab was imaging at 60 frames a second at some point. Now, I'm, I'm not a laser physicist, uh, so very, very big caveat on that one in my reply. But my understanding is that the technology is finicky. It's, it's going to be, uh, it's, so the technology is there, um, the, the innovation as such, so to say, has happened, but engineering this into a solution that's, um, that's suitable for a wider user base and, and really down to labs that don't have the ability to tweak the technology is probably quite a bit of work to do. So I don't know if any manufacturer, if, if they're talking to any manufacturers, if anybody's following up on that themselves, um, but it is something where you can anticipate it will be a few years until then. Um, there are obviously other approaches as well. There, there are other fiber-based approaches that people have looked at to get into this wavelength range using other technologies. So I don't think the last word has been spoken on, on excitation sources for three photon. Um, and the approach um, that, that the Zoo Lab is using is definitely one of the really interesting ones. Question, last question is from Nick. Nick, do you think you will manage it with your nice voice? Or yeah, I sure. I'll give it a go. I, mean, I was just wondering, if, is there anything that you could do th for three photon imaging with a 80 megahertz TIE Sapphire, which is, you know, typically what? Um, or I think my, my, 
general fluorescence, no. The, the, the efficiency is just too low. Um, you, you need average power levels that would just deteriorate, just completely obliterate whatever you're looking at in, if yeah. it's a biological sample. Um, I, have, I have this recollection of hearing people doing third harmonic imaging with, um, with more typical two photon light sources, um, just because it's a very, it's a very, it can be a very bright signal. Um, and actually, if, if you're looking at it um, in, in the typical in vivo two photon or intravital two photon configuration where you're looking at it in the backward direction, so you're exciting down and looking from what comes back, and instead of that, if you look in the forward direction, the forward scattering is even more pronounced. So I think the third harmonic um, three photon imaging is something that, that conceivably could be done with something like a TESA. Um, I don't think that fluorescence imaging is possible. I've I, I, I naively very early on tried just for the heck of it, taking um, an insight, I think it was X3 to 1300 and seeing what I could see, but ultimately you, you get a very inefficient two photon excitation. So if you do a laser intensity to, to fluorescence intensity plot, you get the, the typical second order process. There's, there's no third order there. Um, All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. So thanks Christian, it was an excellent talk. Uh, I loved it and that's the end. So